folks back at home can see. Oh, I mangled this. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My name is Clay Eels. I'm the executive director of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. How many have you been have been over to way over to West Seattle? Some like. All right, about a half of you. Okay. Well, we are what we <laughs> what we lovingly tell people who have not been to West Seattle is, if you can, and you can do this to anybody else. If you prefer, you know, if you're talking about West Seattle and they say, "Huh, where's West Seattle?" Just hold your right hand out in the air, palm out, and the rest of Seattle is the hand, and we are the thumb. We are a peninsula. We are bounded on three sides by water. And so we are a very separate part of, we, we are a part of Seattle, but we're also apart from Seattle, all at the same time. And we're also the birthplace of Seattle. We are where Seattle was founded. Um, just some housekeeping things. You all know where the restrooms are out here. Um, what Colleen has told me is if you're coming in and out for whatever reason, Please go through this door or this door with the white sign on it. Don't try to go through the glass because she says she's closed that up in case the espresso machine goes on and it's very loud. Okay, and then there should be evaluation forms that you can fill out and leave. Um, I'll put this up front. You can just leave it in here on your way out. Come on in. Come on in room. I'm glad you're here today. I think uh, literally this is the coolest place right now, <laughs> if not figuratively, literally. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start this off with a five minute video, and then we're going to cover some stuff, and then I'm going to end it up with a video. Um, and I beg your indulgence here. And what this video is, um, Basically, you know the theme of this, and I'm going to try to relate two stories. We're going to tell two stories today and relate everything in those stories to this theme. And so what I want you to see is the end result of the first story. And this is just a five-minute summary. <laughs> Southwest Seattle Historical Society, and I speak for our board, our staff, our volunteers, and our donors in saying that we are absolutely thrilled at how many of you are here today for this once-in-a-lifetime occasion. To unveil this totem pole that stood for 40 years from 1966 to 2006 at Belvedere Viewpoint Park at the top of Admiral Way. And I'm especially pleased to see how many young people are here today to witness history. Do you know? Do you know that there are more than 950 school children here today? Who here, who here is a student from Lafayette Elementary School? Make some noise. from Alki Elementary School. And who here is from Schmitz Park Elementary School? All right. Now, when I am in the presence of children, I am guided by the words of our late founder, Elliot Cowden. Nearly 20 years ago, Elliot proposed a resolution that was passed unanimously by our board. And the resolution clearly states that our highest priority is the interests and the needs of young people. And this marvelous occasion today is the ultimate illustration. Okay, we're going to move along quickly here. But please welcome Seattle Mayor Ed Murray. This is an incredible 
incredible sight. It's good to see all of you. So uh, it's good to be home. It's good to be on the street I grew up on. It's good to be sitting next to Marcy Johnson, who I used to play with in this very house. <laughs> so you know, it was fun to go to uh, see the Seahawks at the White House, but this is more fun. Please welcome King County Executive Dow Constantine. You know, my, uh, my four-week-old daughter is just over here to the side, really enjoying the ceremony. <laughs> and I hope that she will have the same beautiful experience growing up in West Seattle that I had and that you are having. This totem pole was erected the year before I started kindergarten at uh, Schmitz Park Elementary School. And I hope that uh, it will be able to remind all of you students, whether you live here in West Seattle for the rest of your life, or whether you end up far away and return occasionally, remind you of what a wonderful community this is, a supportive and loving community, and help you remember the great years of growing up here in West Seattle. Thank you for being here today, and congratulations to the Historic Society for bringing our totem pole back. Before we shout it, I want you to know that on the count of three, all the dignitaries will pull on the streamers, and for the very first time, we will see our newly restored Admiral Totem Pole right here at our birthplace of Seattle Log House Museum. Okay, children, let's shout it out. Original social media is face to face. <laughs> and uh, I was talking with a woman about six months ago about this, and she says, Oh, I get it. Facebook. <laughs> Not Facebook, Facebook. <laughs> and the reason this is so compelling is um, that I, it's my contention that, um, that the best things happen when you are face to face. The best things happen when you are in real time. And, and uh, it's so, it was so compelling. Some of you were in the human resources uh, session just an hour ago, and there was a slide up that, that uh, one of the speakers was referencing the New York Times talking about how today things are so busy in our, in our um, work environments that uh, the, the headline is, we don't have time to be nice. No time to be nice. And 
think about for a minute why that is happening today. You know, time is always a, a, a pressure. But why is that happening particularly today? And I would submit that part of the reason is that we are, we are expected to do more because we're always so-called in social contact with everybody every hour of every day. And, you know, there, there could be some of you, even during this next hour, who you are contacting people on your phones. You know, it is, it's, it's, it's endemic. We've, it's happening to all of us. But there are powerful financial forces at work 24-7 to make us do that. It makes people money to get us to be jumping at every step of the way to be in touch with people uh, and, and, and communicating back and forth through texting or email or whatever. And we tend to think that that is the way to communicate these days. And it's my contention, it's our organization's contention, that the real key to making the best things happen for our museum, for our organization, the best things happen as a result of personal relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships that you build up over time. And so what I'm going to do is run through a couple of projects that we have done that have been enormous for us and show you how those things were accomplished because of personal relationships. It's very simple. It's not anything new to any of us, but I think it will help us to know that it is possible to, 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 to make a choice to not be emailing people all the time, but to go look them in the eye to get things done, and it'll be even better that way. Now, what I'm going to start out with is, uh, I've got a long set of slides, but the first chunk of them has, uh, is the presentation that we used as an organization in the year prior to our totem pole unveiling. So, Pretend that you're the Rotary Club right now, or pretend you're the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm taking you through this in person. I'm not emailing you, I'm not texting you, but we are talking about this project. And the project is preserving the Admiral Totem Pole. Some of you uh, who have been to West Seattle, maybe when you were a little kid, even some of you remember before the Space Needle. Um, <clears throat> Seattle's Space Needle before the Space Needle was our Admiral Totem Pole. And this viewpoint was the one that people would come to to have their picture taken, and they still do. And uh, I'm going backwards, so go forwards, Clay. We had a totem pole there. Um, we've had one since 1939. How many of you have been to the EO Curiosity Shop or have heard of that, downtown Seattle? The same guy who founded that lived in West Seattle, and he was, he lived just a few blocks from this spectacular viewpoint from which you could see at the time the Smith Tower, the tallest building <laughs> west of the Mississippi, you know. Space Needle changed all of that but in 1962. But he saw this beautiful viewpoint at the top of Admiral Way, but it was kind of an eyesore. It was, there were weeds, there were, uh, you know, it was overgrown, and he kept writing letter after letter to the city saying, um, you got to fix this up. And finally he said, if you clean this up, I'll give you a totem pole. And so they cleaned it up, and he did. And he gave the city a totem pole in 1939, and this is the one. And uh, it was one year before he died. He got to see this happen. Um, here's an article from the uh, Seattle Times accepting the offer from, his nickname was Daddy. I still haven't been able to figure that out. Joseph E. Stanley, Daddy Stanley. And uh, this is the view I'm talking about you would come and get your picture taken with the totem pole and the Smith Tower in the background. You'd come up Admiral Way Hill. This became famous. This was the symbol of the city. And the one thing to understand about it is that it was carved by the Haida Indians up in Alaska and British Columbia. This notion that, and you see them all over Seattle, colorful totem poles, that they're, they're not indigenous to Seattle. They came from way up north. And they came from way up north, and they were only here, here being the Seattle area. 
because of money, because of the gold rush, because of the AYP, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition in 1909. People loved them. They brought them down here. They made money for people. People were hired to carve them. And this pole was truly the symbol of Seattle. I mean, it was on festival programs. This is from 1952, the same viewpoint. It was, uh, even when I was a little kid, it was on the front of the Seattle phone book, three years in a row. It was a hard totem pole on the front. And, uh, and over time, from 1939, it deteriorated. And so there were times when the city fixed it up. Here's a uh, clipping from, again, from the Seattle Times where they're giving it a facelift. Sometimes when they reported about this stuff, it was not the most sensitive way. Take a look. Um, we have, uh, oh, th there's one to come, I'm sorry. Uh, but they took it down to give it so-called surgery, put it back up again. It was on the cover of the Sunday pictorial magazine that you used to get in the Seattle Times, and it was in color, gorgeous. Uh, they would have, uh, uh, you know, tours of Seattle, and you had to come and see the totem pole. This was an icon. Any of you remember our uh, Seattle Mayor Greg Nichols from the mid-2000s? There he is in the middle. That's him posing with his family. It's just typical of so many families. Um, and then here we have another story in 1966. County Hunting Ground, not the best headline. But it um, was fixed up, and then it deteriorated, fixed up. And by this point, the city said it was too bug-eaten and too painless <coughs> faded too much that they needed to have a new totem pole. And so there were two Boeing engineers, Mike Morgan and uh, Bob Flashman, who uh, volunteered to carve it for free. And so the city said, sure, we'll do it. And uh, a log was cut from Schmitz Park in West Seattle. And this is Mike, Mike Morgan and Bob Flashman. Mike's wife, these two guys are not, not alive anymore, but his wife is Diane. And she told me how she spread newsprint on the old pole and traced the old pole's markings so that this would become an exact replica. And these uh, slides tell you the process of carving, and here are the rubbings, and then the patterns are being transferred, and the finishing work. And, it, and once it was finished, then it was ready to be painted, and this became kind of a community project in Seattle. Um, really a fun thing for people to join in on a real point of pride, because people had fallen in love with, with the soda pole. So, it was ready to be put up, and even the whole front page of the West Seattle Herald, again, let's think about personal relationships. This is the Kiwanis Club having a dinner about the totem pole un unveiling. At the unveiling, for which you saw the video, <coughs> the two co-chairs of this event in 1966 were still alive, and we pulled them back for the raising at our museum. So they were among the 27 dignitaries. We had each one of them pulling on one of the streamers um, to give it some weight for the media to cover, <coughs> give it some uh, dignity and seriousness, uh, and, and just to, to a sense of history. More photos of the pole. And then, you know, the same thing happened to this pole. This, remember, this is the replica. This isn't the original. And by 2006, the paint, as you can see, was really in bad shape. And, uh, and, and the bugs had gotten to it. And so the city, what did I do to it? <laughs> it's all right. We'll be back. I know we'll be back. Oh, there, there it goes. So um, there it is. it's always the tech, you know. So we. Actually, this, this, it'll be back up. What's going on? All right. We had worked with the Parks Department on other projects, and uh, in, in, in particular, um, the, uh, the the centennial, or, or the, excuse me, the sesquicentennial of the landing of the settlers in 2001, and also we had worked with Parks Department personnel um, on. Uh, oh, the, uh, the, you all remember where you were for 
that week, that horrible week, and people gathered on Alki, and, and there, there was a campaign to put these paper bag luminarias all up and down Alki, and there were 1,692 bags, and we, we have all of the bags. And so that was in 2001. We were in contact with the Parks Department a great deal. So the Parks Department said, we'll give it to you on the understanding that you will fix it up and unveil it at your museum. So that's what we did. This is the, the pole coming down. And um, we had volunteer labor, Alki Lumber, one of the oldest businesses in West Seattle. Again, this is not a cold call. This is somebody whom we know in the community. And we can go face to face and say, can you help get this log down to our museum? And this is where it sat for a couple of years on its side in our courtyard. And this is the end of the presentation because this presentation was to inspire people to contribute money so that we could get the job done. And here was the sketch for how it was to look at our museum. You know, it's hard to, hard to promote something that you can't see. And so this was approximately the way it, it looked like. Now, now um, just people, there, there are all kinds of people. I can't even... Um, go through the whole list, but here's a great example. Um, I went to the volunteer fair and, at a booth at, at South Seattle College and recruited these four students to come and help leaflet the neighborhood to prepare them for the construction and the people who were coming to this ceremony. And so they're posing on our porch right before they go out and hand out leaflets to everybody. And then, then you're going to see some slides of the actual work being done. This is um, Roger Waterhouse of Art Tech. Some of you may know the firm Art Tech. And we were able to, I mean, I sat across the table, just like one of these tables, and ask Art Tech for an in-kind contribution for the services that they were providing us. And we got a 40% discount on the restoration work. This would normally have been a $20,000 project and it was uh, closer to 12. And um, so we built a relationship with them. I did a video with them when they were working on it in their warehouse, put it up, gave them prominence, recognition, and here they are just a week before, actually this is two weeks before the totem, they're bending rebar to put, put the cage together that will go down into this hole to stabilize the totem pole. You can see the box that uh, is being created for the rebar to go in. And then they're pouring the cement. Um, it's a fascinating process. I, how often do you get to put a totem pole up? <laughs> this is a, this is a 20 by, or 30 by 30 by 30 box of concrete. And the amazing thing to me, I mean, just those of you who've done any kind of construction, the pole used to be held up with, and you can see the notches in the back, all the way up the, the, the length of the 20-foot pole. But all they needed was a six-foot armature. This was structural engineering that we had to pay for. Um, but to hold up a 20-foot pole with only a six-foot armature is pretty amazing, I think. And they're drilling the holes for the, uh, for the screws. And then came the day when the pole was delivered. Now, the pole... Oh gosh, there's so much to tell. Um, you're looking at the pole, and it's about to be righted on its end. But I want you to take a look at the two people on either end on the street. And these are media. Uh, this is Patrick Robinson on the right from the West Seattle Herald, and over on the left is Bettina Hansen, photographer for the Seattle Times. We had worked with Bettina, and here's Bettina crouching down to get her shot. Um, we had worked with her on a couple of other stories, and so she already knew us from the one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so she was much more uh, open to coming out and, and photographing this for the times. And here's the pole going up into place, straight up. And uh, you notice it's all covered up. Um, we made sure that it was covered up because we were going for a ceremony of an unveiling. But this is all batting. Uh, it's not very, it doesn't look very nice, but it, it, and you can actually see the shape of the pole underneath it. And in this shape, this is what the Seattle Times printed the day before the ceremony was 
to happen. So not only do we get in the times, but it got in the times beforehand so that more people would come to the ceremony. What you saw in the video, that's the biggest event we've ever done in our organization's history. 1,300 people in the street. And uh, let me back up a bit and say that that ceremony required four separate city permits and one-on-one, -on -one, face to face conversations with the city and even getting some exceptions. And if any of you uh, dealt with a setback in your front yard, at one point the city said, well, you can't put it in your setback because you're, not, you're supposed to leave a setback. And, and if we were abided by that, we would, the only place we would put it is back in our courtyard, which would, would have been hidden and nobody could see it. <laughs> and so it took some going to the, to the supervisor of the permit person and going to the city council member, Tom Rasmussen, from West Seattle, who is on our advisory council, with whom we have worked literally for decades, back to when he was an aide to Jeanette Williams on the council in the 1980s. So again, it's pulling these people in that you have had um, a relationship built with over time. It's not an accident that, that this happens. A lot goes into it. Well, what's next? We wanted to have something that would uh, be a, a dramatic way to, to unveil this, but it would also be attractive. Well, how are you going to cover up a 20-foot totem pole? What would you use? Any ideas? You know what this is? It's a parachute. It's a used parachute, which we got at a very uh, good bargain. And the person in the front is a volunteer, again, one-on-one -on -one relationships, a volunteer who is a member of our board, Terry Korsgaard, who also is a professional stagehand. And she loves putting things together, working with her hands to, to, to develop stage work. And so she adapted the uh, used parachute and put the streamers on it and boy you can see she's very proud of her work and without her special skill we wouldn't have had a wonderful covering to unveil. It's, it's sort of like putting a, put, putting a gift wrapping on a package. It doesn't last very long but it's nice while it's there, right? So, um, the last step was to uh, put the sign in and again we got a discount on the sign because we had worked with Davis Sign before. And this is uh, our facilities committee chair, Al Bentley, putting in this, the concrete. And again, to put the sign in, took a city permit. They had to have somebody come out and check that it was deep enough and straight enough and all that. Now, I'm going to take you back a little ways. Um, this is all leading up to a big ceremony. Well, we've done some big ceremonies in the past. Um, this is five years ago now. Last year, it was four years ago. With the Alpi Homestead, this is one half block from us. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But I want you to know that we had done some of these big projects before where we involve a number of folks. Um, the Alpi Homestead had suffered damage in a fire in 2009, one of Seattle's most beloved landmarks. Um, and certainly West Seattle's most beloved landmark, arguably. And uh, there wasn't a lot of movement, and we'd been working behind the scenes with the, that owner, with the city, couldn't move this thing along. So we thought, let's do a group photo. The Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, affiliated with the National Trust, has a campaign called This Place Matters. So we adapted that for our use, created a Actually, this sign, This Place Matters, had already been created and used up in Everett. We just used it here. And this photograph was taken on Independence Day of 2010 at our annual picnic. And so we had a critical mass, but we ended up having exactly 200 people and one dog. <laughs> and we have some prominent folks, Dow Constantine, our county executive, our former mayor, Greg Nichols, and a number of other people from West Seattle. Um, but this was turned into a poster that was then distributed all around West Seattle to just build the awareness that there is a huge support for this landmarked building to be restored. So there's one example of something where we brought a lot of people together. 
to show support. And then and the next one, this comes from a few years later in 2013. This is something anybody can do, but again, it takes one-on-one -on -one relationship. We knew that the 100th birthday of Alki Elementary School was coming up. The PTA was going to put that together. We contacted the PTA, met with them one-on-one, -on -one, and said, we would like to co-sponsor this with you. They said, well, we, we, want to do, we know what we want to do inside the building. And we said, sure, let's help get people to the event, and we'll take care of the outside of the building. And did a group photo of anybody who was invited who's ever attended Alki Elementary School. So there are little five-year-old kindergartners partners there, and there are 90-year-olds and every age in between. And this was made available to everybody who came to the ceremony. So we, we've done this kind of thing, and so we knew that our totem unveiling was a big deal. We wanted a lot of people there. So based on the relationship with Alki Elementary School, we went to talk to the principal and said, we've got this educational opportunity with the totem pole. We could have the kids come, they could hear a couple of brief speeches, but they really are there to witness history and to make history. And, and as I said, you heard me in the video, for the rest of their lives, they will say and know that they were there. And so to schedule that whole totem thing was dependent on when the school kids could come. That was the whole determining factor. And, there, and I, I had a slot of 10.30 in the morning or 2.30 in the afternoon, and I, 10:30 because that's when the sun is shining on the pole. You know, logistics come into this, but you're working with uh, your the school. So, on this magical day, um, how fortunate are you? Again, one-on-one -on -one relationships. Ed Murray grew up on Alki. He grew up in a house across the street from our museum where the totem pole went. Dow Constantine, our county executive, who is destined for a higher office, I guarantee you, he grew up next to Schmitz Park and went to Schmitz Park Elementary School. So we had Ed Murray walk the Alki kids to the ceremony. How did Schmitz Park get involved? I was at the Schmitz Park auction, sitting with Vicki Schmitz, the namesake family of the park, and on the other side was Garrett Kishner, the principal, and she says, tell Garrett about this thing you've got going with the totem. And after 10 minutes, he's saying, we want it, we've got to be part of that too. So we grew from 350 students to adding 550 students. And we had more than 900 at the ceremony, and they all walked, led by their elected official, who was a graduate of each school. Again, one on one on one. Um, here's the scene that you saw. It, it was. This is a, a screen grab from a separate video on our website. If you go there, it's a three minute video that crunches two hours into three minutes. It's a stop motion. It's really fun to watch the kids swarm in as if they're a river. And here they are at the exact moment of the unveiling. And then we have this, this succession of the, uh, the shroud coming off the pole. And it was an amazing day. As you heard on the soundtrack, immediately afterward, we had the Duwamish tribe there to bless it. The Duwamish tribe, that's a whole separate story. We, we, we got a whole 